and welcome everyone to Women's Health Tech Wednesdays. I am your host, Nina Joshi, and today we will be bringing on a guest from our very own HitLab family, Vandana Yadav. Vandana is a research and strategy manager at HitLab. Uh, as you know, we love questions at Women's Health Tech Wednesday, so if you have any, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And before I bring on our guest, just wanted to let everyone know that our Breakthrough Alliance cohort applications are available and the deadline um, was on the 14th, but it seems like it has been extended, so all of the information is in the chat. Uh, please be sure to check that out. Awesome. And so with that, I would like to bring on our guest, Vandana. Hi, Vandana. Thanks so much for being here today. Hi, Nina. It's a pleasure to be here. Really excited. We are too. Um, and of course, since this is Women's Health Tech Wednesdays, we have to start the conversation by asking you, what does Women's Health Tech mean to you? Um, well, it means a lot of things, but at the essence of it, it's about making women realize the power of technology when it comes to improving their lives, improving their health needs, about using technology to educate them, what are their options to understand their health better and to make informed decisions when it comes to their own health. Um, and also now, as we are moving more towards virtual trials, then making representation of women in clinical research more a commonplace practice and not something which has to be advocated for. So really, you know, making women at the center of their healthcare, not just as an individual, but as a community, as 50% of the world's population. Absolutely. And I love that you really called out in all the different ways in which, you know, women can have a seat at the table. And of course, it's very um, research and strategy manager of you to bring up the research component, because I would love to kind of, you know, do a deep dive into that as we uh, continue our conversation. But before we kind of pick your brain about all things research, uh, first, would love if you could just share with us about your background and kind of the journey that has led you to uh, this current position at HitLab. Sure. Um, well, I was always a researcher. And when I say so, that means I always had a curious mindset. Uh, when I was in high school, I, I really liked biology, but I also liked technology equally. Uh, that means maths and physics at that time. So I didn't want to go for pure medicine or pursue, you know, becoming an, a doctor by MBBS, but I really wanted something which is an amalgamation of bio and technology. That's why I opted for engineering and biotechnology. I did it from one of the leading, uh, you know, institutes under University of Delhi because I'm from Delhi. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, there is a saying about engineering colleges in India that they really are like a pressure comes upon them. They give, uh, you know, a comprehensive syllabus or curriculum to cover. They really put you in tough situations, but, you know, so that you can learn. When Only when you're thrown off from the cliff, you know how to fly. So they really <laughs> teach you the hard way, but they teach in a manner that stays with you for life. Mm -hmm. So that was the fundamental of, of uh, you know, my experience of understanding how research is done, what is biotechnology, because I interned in different labs, I worked in genetics lab, I worked in bioinformatics lab, I learned about uh, RNA, DNA, combinant technology, and, you know, lots of similar stuff. So my curiosity just, just uh, you know, increased and increased. And for that reason, after my undergraduation, I didn't go for any work placements as, as most of my peers were doing, mm -hmm. but I actually went for a master in science uh, in biomedical sciences uh, mm -hmm. at University of Edinburgh. That was another uh, a chapter in its own and, and a very rewarding experience. Uh, it was not a usual taught master's degree, but it was a research degree. Uh, and I got the opportunity to work on two very, uh, very interesting projects. The first was on um, tumorogenesis in uh, mice cancer wow. cells. Uh, and the second one was even more interesting. It was on the idea of uh, reducing or replacing the use of animals for clinical research. So we were actually trying to develop um, kidney models from uh, mice kidney stem cells so that those kidney models can be used for uh, testing uh, toxicity of chemotherapy drugs like mm -hmm. cisplatin. Uh, 
So usually before, you know, clinical trials, normally a drug has to go through animal trials. Mm -hmm. But what if we can simulate that environment clinically in a lab and reduce the sacrifice of animals for our selfish need? So that's, yeah, it was, it was incredible. very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So that was it. And, you know, originally I was very focused on this idea of pursuing PhD because I was very research driven. Mm -hmm. But then uh, over the years when I was working on these projects, I realized one thing that, uh, you know, in while the academic career is very uh, rigorous and it's very rewarding at the end of it, but it takes mm -hmm. a long time to see the impact on the real world. And for me, I wanted mm -hmm. to see the impact a little faster. So I, I was really uh, looking for a combination where I can have research, I can uh, be in touch with latest technology and I can deploy my skills and see the effect of it quickly, you know, and, and I can touch lives, I can make improvements. And that's where perfectly HitLab comes in. <laughs> that's how uh, HitLab you know, provided everything at one place for me and I was, I was delighted. So I joined the lab as a research associate, really working at the core of, uh, various types of research projects and um, it it was a, a very enriching experience so far I I mean we take up new projects every month every quarter and we work on multiple projects it's just not the depth of uh, expertise we get in multiple areas but also the breadth of digital health technologies and type of stakeholders we work with so yeah it's a you know for me it's a perfect fit and that's that's why I love working here that's incredible. And I would say because things are moving so quickly to be able to have a pull some kind of everything that's going on in one place sounds um, very rewarding. And I can just tell as you're talking that research in general is such a, a passion point for you kind of throughout your, your journey. Um, so it's, it's so great to kind of see that you are able to take what you've learned kind of with your academic rigor, but like you said, apply it to uh, real world situations. Um, and kind of speaking at your current role, would love if you could tell us a little bit more about, you know, what makes you passionate about this type of research at HIT Lab and a little bit more about, you know, what types of research do you do in this current position? Sure. So, you know, HIT Lab uh, as a, a center, as a laboratory is really facilitating various budding startups, medtech companies, pharmaceutical companies, health systems, um, you know, nonprofits, uh, establish some sort of evidence around digital health technology that or the digital health service that they are trying to build. Mm -hmm. And why uh, research is important or why evidence generation is important, because it is really the first step of the ladder. Uh, you know, the ladder that leads to success, the ladder that leads to market penetration, the ladder that leads to acceptance of the technology. Mm -hmm. um, and research is not just done to demonstrate impact. It is done to inform yourself. It is done for yourself to, as an as a entrepreneur to understand, is it the right space that you're investing your energy in? Are you right? starting at the right foot have you uh, considered all the problem scenarios and picked up the right need to address what is the addressable market what are the financial projections it is just not that you you are just passionate about a product about a sector and you go after it you know it has to be sustainable it has to be financially business wise feasible later on so uh, not just clinical validation is important to demonstrate it works properly and it is safe for the users, but then technical validation, can it be pulled off with the latest technology? Will it be interoperable at where you want to sell it? So, you know, all these are informed by good research, focused research in various directions, and you have to do it. I mean, you, you need it at every stage to progress to the next stage. If you don't do it, it's like, you are one horse running in a single lane and have no idea where the rest of the world is. And it's your yeah. luck if you make good. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that that's amazing. And I like that you called out, I think, you know, when you think about research, especially kind of in an early stage environment. I like how you mentioned, you know, some of the things that you really look for, which is efficacy, right? Want to make sure that what you are building is actually going to be valuable. But I like that you also call out the value of research just as an, as a learning for the entrepreneur or the company, you are kind of able to understand almost like your business strategy just based off of research kind of as a starting point, which I don't, I definitely, it's something that I am continuously reminded of, of, of that value as well. 
Um, so I like that you you called that out. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, and so wanted to also kind of get get a sense from you. I know that you mentioned that you do research within the pharma space, within the the med tech space, digital health. I uh, would love if you could share, you know, within kind of this research huge umbrella, what type of research projects are you currently working on? Okay. Um, well, I cannot name the specifics, but in terms yeah. of the type <laughs> of projects we work on and what are the different uh, types of evaluations or digital health solution validations we do, uh, right away, you know, starting from the ideation stage, just thinking about what is the purpose of building this technology? What sort of features and functions should be included? What are the alternatives in the market? Is it already been very well established by a leading player? And if you're trying to still do it, what is your competitive edge? Why are you doing it at the first place? So, you know, uh, helping them at the ideation stage. And this can be uh, when you are just starting and you have an idea in mind, what sort of validation you will look for? You look for an expert opinion somebody who has the right expertise who can guide you whether this is worth investing in or not mm. or you would look for case examples mm -hmm. like who has done similar things in the past what were their projections were they successful is the case directly relevant to us or applicable to us and things like that then the other thing that we help uh, you know various companies and startups with is concept evaluation so mm. understanding the user needs understanding uh, you know it shouldn't happen but sometimes it does happen that you are you have a solution and you're trying to find a problem that that yes. should not happen in the <laughs> world <laughs> there should be an actual problem and your solution should be designed around the person who experiences that problem so no matter if you are an expert in metaverse but if you you build a metaverse technology that is not user friendly and the user is struggling around it and I'm actually not using it, it doesn't make sense at the end of the day. So you have to keep in mind uh, that the center of things is user acceptability, the user centricity. Have you asked the user that this is what they need? Have you checked what are their pain points? Have you done your needs assessment? And how are you designing the solution? How will it fit in their usual lifestyle, in their you know normal environment? Is it made to, to be really used for them or it is just like a technical fascination in your mind so yeah. how exactly you are close to reality to actually see that product world and you know work in real world what is the concept how sound and deep is your concept and who who or what is your the uh, target market who all will be using it do you have an interface uh, suitable for every stakeholder you are planning to give it to or you're just you know focused on okay consumer will use it and doctor will manage it on its own no okay <laughs> Right. It has to be friendly both ways and, and vice versa. So that's that's more about concept evaluation. Mm -hmm. And then we also do the clinical evaluation. What is the clinical efficacy of the product? How mm -hmm. exactly it is built? Will it deliver clinically what it promises to? How safe it is it? And then uh, we do the usability analysis of it. We actually put it in the hands of some prospective users and oh. you know their feedback and not just random feedback there's a whole lot of research goes behind it like what sort of questions we have to ask where we have to bring in the focus of users so that they give us this targeted feedback on this particular specific you know feature or function of the device or the technology and to incorporate that uh, if if the product is already in the development stage, but they are seeking for another iteration, then, then it can come in there. Or it can be something that you are very confident about your product, but you just need some testimonials, uh, mm -hmm. some good testimonials. So you can go to an investor and say, look, this is what the users are saying. They're really happy with it. And it's a great opportunity to invest in. So, you know, uh, there are different purposes for doing different types of evaluation, not just for... Um, not just for um, making your own business strategy, your own yearly milestones from and you know strengthen them, but also to demonstrate to the world. So, um, and, and then there is another aspect where we talk about uh, feasibility or implementation from an organization or system point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, many times the, the technologies we work with, uh, they are not like, um, independent apps that a consumer will use. I mean, they can be, but many times there are like diagnostic softwares which will go and integrate in a health system. 
So will it talk to rest of the health system? How easily will it be adopted by them? Is it an extra burden or it, it, is it streamlined and, and you know just smooth adoption for them? Because the providers are already burdened. No matter how accurate your software is in predicting, I don't know what cancer or predicting, you know, the, the respective diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But if it's a burden to work with, they will not use yep. it. Absolutely. So uh, feasibility considerations are also important. So we really uh, at the lab help our, uh, you know, partners, our sponsors, the people we work, work with, all these budding startups, medtech companies, to give them evidence to sound their decisions clinically, experientially, integrationally. And, and that's where, you know, HIPLAB uh, model of research really comes in. That is incredible. And what a robust, like, suite of, of research initiatives. I like that it seems like you're really kind of shepherding people along from that ideation phase up until, you know, uh, scalability. And I really like that you mentioned uh, scalability because I think we kind of hear this time and time again about the, the fragmented system that it can be from a provider perspective where, you know, this, like you were mentioning, the solution may be great, but if it's another extra few minutes for them to utilize it when they're already very busy seeing patients that, you know, they're not going to really adopt it. So I like that you're thinking from really, really small up until, you know, large scale change. Absolutely. Yeah. We, it's, I mean, um, it, it, nothing is linear. It is multifactorial. It is multidimensional. You have to keep in mind and think in, you know, all the directions in the 3D, 4D or whatever dimensions you have to fit it Absolutely. in the work system and make it work. Yeah. Something that you had, when you had talked about um, some of the work that you do kind of within the, um, like the usability kind of phase where you're kind of putting things in the hands of people. I um, would love if you could share just, I'm, it's, I'm just curious <laughs> about kind of how do you go about recruiting users when it comes to these types of study? Um, and has that been, you know, easier kind of or harder given uh, the fact that so much of things are now virtual? I would love your, your perspective on that. Yeah, no, sure. So, uh, okay. Deciding the right prospective user depends directly on understanding the technology. The first thing we do on any research product uh, project is understand the focus area of, of our partner of the company we're working with very clearly. Uh, many underestimate this process. This is the most important process. You don't just understand what is the specific ask that they have come up, uh, you know, they have come to us with, but also what is the purpose behind that ask? For example, if they say and come up, you know, we want to do a user interview study. We want some uh, feedback on whether we are building it right or not. That's a simple thing. But then what are they going to do this, do uh, with the data they get out of this study? Will they actually use this data to inform their development or they will use this data to create new uh, use cases for the developed product? Or will they create this data to make a subset of the company that handles some other type of version of the product? Or will they use this data to show to investors like this has been promising so far and we will make this developments and so and so. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, let's say if it is actually for development and I'm taking a hypothetical example, let's say there is a diagnostic tool for um, endometriosis, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we are not, there has not been done much in the space of endometriosis yet, despite it has been such a grave problem for people who suffer from it. Still, we are lacking a lot of solutions in this space. So let's say uh, a company has developed a diagnostic solution. It's a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, since it's a diagnostic solution, it's, and it's for endometriosis, which is relatively a complicated, uh, you know, uh, a complicated disease. It is projected to be used by clinicians uh, and right. they want some feedback on whether the clinicians will be ready to adopt it in their clinic settings and to use it on their users. What do they think about the technology? So the study is really around the perceived utility of the device, the perceived fit of the device in the clinical setting. So we will, uh, first of all, look for clinicians who are likely to use it. So OBGYNs will be using it, you know, women health doctors, primary health uh, practitioners are less likely to use it or women will be less likely to be used, I mean, to go uh, with such ask to primary health providers, right. which be specialist or preferred. 
So choosing the right target uh, user, first of all, and then um, gauging whether they would be interested in contributing to such a research activity. Clinicians mm -hmm. are very busy. They are, of course, the workloads they have at hand. So we do outreach virtually, we tap into our networks, we get the relevant people mm -hmm. on board, we uh, make sure that we give them an introduction to the technology such that we are not revealing a lot of detail about the company because usually at the beginning of development, they don't prefer that. But we do right. a right balance, which is enough for them to understand what we are talking about, what the technology promises to do. And based on the features and functions we explain, we will solicit you know, specific feedback on what do you think about this technical capability? What do you think about this clinical promise that the technology is making? And what sort of feasibility considerations you will have? Will it have some barriers? Or do you anticipate any challenges when you will actually begin using it in your clinic? And what should be its price? Would you be happy, uh, you know, to sponsor for your patients? Or would you like patients to pay out of pocket? Or do you think this can be reimbursed under mm. some, some of the existing... You know, right. there's yeah, a lot of a lot, a lot of information you can gather. Right. That's an, so thank you is, for walking us example. through that. <laughs> I think I think it just right. goes to show that there's so much nuance. There's so many different factors to kind of consider, and it really takes someone and a team that's very kind of methodical and very intentional. Um, so I think you just spoke to really the power of research um, with that with that example. Um, I know we are about six minutes out, so wanted to quickly ask you, um, you know, you have been in the space for a, a, a long time. You probably have seen so much and have so much, you know, wealth of experience. Would love to kind of get from, from your perspective, this will be like Vandana's hot take. What is, um, what excites you about new technology? Is there any uh, technology that maybe you're seeing in development that you think, um, you know, could be really interesting, could be a good discovery? Uh, what types of trends are you seeing out there? Sure. Um, well, if we talk about in general technology, uh, metaverse is really exciting. Um, mm. I know it's still at nascent stages, especially in healthcare. And when we talk about uh, applying it to telehealth, it will come with a lot of ethical considerations, understood, but still it is very exciting. Well, you know, any breakthrough at once has been uh, looked with skeptical eyes and, yeah. and judged, you know, harshly, but then eventually technology just surprises us and as it grows and as it, you know, shows promise and, and delivers. So I'm hoping something similar for metaverse. Um, That'd be amazing. Well, I've heard of cases already. I mean, it's not metaverse, but for example, if you can use VR technology and a combination of robotics to perform surgery when the surgeon is in one country and the surgery is being performed in another country, like mm -hmm. who would have imagined that a few decades ago? If that's yeah, happening, <laughs> yeah, we would soon be in a metaverse healthcare setting. And that, <laughs> that just completely transformed the healthcare accessibility scenario. You know, it has mm -hmm. uh, tremendous potential that way. Um, well, talking about women health tech, um, first of all, I'm really happy with the progress we are making. I mean, how the space in general is evolving in, in last mm -hmm. four to five years, especially. But still, um, honestly, I would say the concentration of development has been limited to some areas. For example, uh, there are a lot of solutions in maternal health, in menstrual health, or in sexual health or fertility. But what about menopause? What about contraception? What about endometriosis? What about other you know, similar neglected areas that are still very significant and a lot of population, women population are suffering from it. So we need more uh, diversity in terms of concentration of developments, technical developments in these spaces. Um, we are just growing more and more on saturated markets. And I'm not saying that we are not making progress. I have seen solutions coming up in menopause space, but comparatively still, I mean, people are just running more towards fertility or, or towards <laughs> menstrual health in general. Yeah. I, uh... I, I totally agree. I think there, there's still so much um, work to be done. And I, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's important to acknowledge the progress that's been made, but also um, you know, share the opportunity areas. And when you mentioned in your example, diagnostic for endometriosis, I was like, oh, that sounds amazing. But I'm, I'm definitely hopeful that there's gonna be a lot more attention um, to these specific places. Um, and then one last quick question that we ask everyone as we wrap up our time together is, 
what are some words of wisdom, whether that's advice that you have, advice that maybe you were given by a mentor that you want to share with uh, the women's health tech community? Sure. Um, well, first of all, as a researcher, I would say always have a curious mind, question everything and, you know, listen with an open mindset, just have, uh, you know, uh, be receptive to feedback, just have mm -hmm. an open brain as there is a, uh, there's a very uh, famous saying in Hindi, but I'll translate it in English, a rock that will fear chiseling will never become a sculpture. So Ooh. if you are uh, fearful of being hit or, or being questioned, you will never improve. So, you know, always keep questioning, always uh, keep researching uh, and talking in the context of women's health as well. As a researcher, when I landscape research and, and see there are so many technologies in women's health space, but as a consumer, I'm not so aware. I'm not so aware of so many of them. Right. So mm -hmm. it is not the duty of the companies to create more awareness but also as a consumer, you should do a search every, you know, now and then to, you know, to know what exists in the market, what, what can be helpful for you, what can make a difference to your life, to your health. So it's I important think, to be curious. I love that. And I love, we all should aim to be statues and not rocks. I think that is uh, an incredible um, way to end it. Thank you so much, Vandana, for, for your time today. Um, and I think you really just made the case for just the the benefit, the value of research and really what it can mean, not just for an individual company, but really for everyone as we are entering, you know, this new and very exciting phase of innovation and technology. So really appreciate you um, taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you so much. It has been a great pleasure. Thank you. All right, awesome everyone. I uh, just have a couple of announcements. Uh, next week, we will be chatting um, with Sneha from Qualcomm. So please be sure to check that out. We also have a um, symposium that is coming up and there we go. <laughs> the application deadline has been extended. All that information is in the chat. So please register. Um, we also have a podcast. Uh, so that new episode will be available as well as the digital health symposium. Uh, wanted to give one last huge shout out to Vandana for just taking the time to chat with us today. Also wanted to thank our sponsors, Goodwin and Witham, and we'll see you all next week. Bye, everyone. <laughs>